so it's, uh, it's Matthew chapter 1. We're talking about stories within the story that we know the main story, but there's a lot of other stories, kind of plate spinning around it as well. Joseph is quite a character. He is quite an amazing guy, and he probably would have been even more famous if not for his kid and that wife. Um, but it was, that's just the way it is. I mean, you know, you, you kinda, he kind of gets shoved into page, you know, the back pages of three and four because of those that he's associated with. It actually made me think of uh, C.S. Lewis. When he died, nobody knew because he died the same day as John F. Kennedy, the day he was uh, assassinated. Poor C.S. Lewis, right? It would have been a front page story. We would have been fascinated, but we didn't care because we had a national tragedy on the very same day. Joseph is kind of that way. He gets lost in the, in the shuffle of people, and yet he is an unbelievable example of courage and maturity. And I pretty sure he wouldn't be offended at this. He is an excellent example of being ordinary. There really wasn't anything about him that you're like, oh, I'm not worthy. Oh, no, you're worthy. He was common guy. He's the guy down the street. There was a, a streak of normal to him that makes him so remarkable because of the strength of what he pulled off. So it's Matthew chapter 1, and before we actually look, let me pray, and let's, let's pray as has been recommended already, that we maybe pull something out of this that we've not thought of before and be challenged. Father, and we're asking that you would reveal something to us. We want to walk out today different and better than when we came in. We know you can do that. So allow us in the craziness of this week, a brief 30 minutes where we could just sit and listen and soak in and engage our mind and possibly better ourselves, maybe even change a direction. So we're open and we're willing. In Jesus' name, amen. If we look at Joseph, the first thing, let me just mention three things we could learn from him. One is that we too can imitate him and be just and willing. He was just and willing. What's, we all like have nothing about him. We know nothing about this guy. But there's one phrase, there's one little phrase, and it's even in kind of almost a negative context. But it's Matthew chapter 1, and if you look at verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus took place this way when the uh, mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Here it is, one of the only descriptions of Joseph. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. So in a negative context, ages are pretty typical. Mary's age, 12 to 15. Joseph's age, 18 to 20. That would be the norm. He finds out that she's with child. Well, he has every right to make a deal out of this. Well, not like to take the moral ground to try to teach her a lesson. He's defending himself. This is humiliating. Because one of two things happened. They spent a little extra special time together before they were married, or she did with somebody else. Both cases, he loses. So rather than come out of that with this strong statement to declare how bad she is, fully justified to do so, there's the phrase. 
and her husband Joseph being a just man, unwilling to put her to shame. He, like, covered her. He's like, I'm not, I'm not going to have her be looked at like this. I'm not going to make, I'm going to do what I can to protect this situation. Now, the word just, that word is used 20 times in the New Testament. Now, those are fun when it's something like that. When it says he's a just man, in your mind already, you're like, well, I wonder what that means. Some translations say he was a righteous man. Others say he was a just man. Well, which is it? Well, what's fun about this, and actually it is kind of fun, kind of slash like a geek, so you're, it's fun slash geeky, is you list the 20 examples. So you can see the context. Who else was called just? That's what you want to know. You look at the 20. Look at the context of all of them, and within it, you can get an idea of what it is he's being referred to as. And of the 20 examples, one of them is in the story of Jesus. It's that story, it's that character that we've learned that Janet really likes, Simeon. So, yeah, if you didn't come to the Sunday school presentation, you missed that. Um, so you want to do it next year. Um, Simeon was this wonderful old man, lived devout, and God had this special little thing with him where he said, don't worry, you're not going to die before you get to see him. In the middle of changing the world, God has this thing going on the side with this one person who was a just man. So all of the chaos of Herod and these wise men. And yes, God did speak to Zechariah. So yes, all of that, all of these characters, they're wonderful. God has one. He goes, now this one, hey everybody, Hey, this one's pretty special. He loves us so much. And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's good. Let's get back to the story. No, you know what? I'm going to communicate to him and say, you know what? You're amazing. You'll get to hold him. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? And he's referred to as just. There's another one. There's 20, right? There's 20. Are you counting out? So, if, like, I just did one in three minutes. Oh, yeah, that's, that's bothersome, isn't it? That bothers you a little bit. Those are the short ones. Wait till you get to the last seven. These are really amazing. No, I'll just give you one more. The one more is when Jesus uh, is standing on trial. Remember it said, um, what's wrong with he? He's innocent. This man is innocent. Same word. He's just. Same exact word. He's just. He's just, therefore he's innocent. So it was cause. So cause, just, he's innocent. Joseph was a just man. Out of anything to do, be right. Not right. I'm right, you're wrong. Be righteous. Be just in the office when there's chaos. It'd be really nice if you could just gossip a little bit to lower somebody. No, be just. Because that's what God honors. There is no doubt between sitting here and listening online, somebody's thinking of leaving their family. Do what's just. Don't be driven by the emotion of the moment. You want emotion? Joseph, who's living a really good life, I mean, he is like staple, this is the kind of guy, and his life became disastrous. With the one that he loved, he's in a bad situation. Emotion. What do I do? His buddies down at the bagel shop, 
You know what they were all saying? They were all saying, you've got to get out of this. You got to, this is disastrous. This is not good. Never did like her. He goes, yeah, I, I hear all of you. I, I hear it, but I'm going to do what's right. And I'm going to let the chips fall. So in your school, schoolwork with a teacher at work, in your family, do what's right. There's a movie, Cinderella Man, by Ron Howard. There's kind of a Joseph-type character in that movie. It takes place during the Great Depression, and the father is a boxer who lost everything, and the family is literally starving to death. So his son steals a loaf of bread to help the starving family. And the father rebukes his son and makes him apologize to the storekeeper. You see that? What's he passing on now to his family? He's passing on a strong value, which is, I would rather be hungry and righteous than we're all justifying behavior. It's a very good Joseph type. The boxer, apparently not very good. Right? I mean, he's not even that great at what he's doing. But what is he passing on? Son, not acceptable. One thing we've decided, we're going to do what's right. And if we're hungry doing it, we'll be hungry. If you get demoted at work, then you're demoted at work. Marrying this girl who's a horrible reputation, which it's brought up again later. It's brought up 30 years later in a passage that is still demeaning to Joseph and Mary 30 years later. And we'll look at that in a moment. Be just and be willing to do the right thing. It simplifies. It really makes things a lot easier. Don't engage the mind. Don't get caught up in the emotion. Don't play the game of figure. Just do what's right. Then we hand it to the Lord and say, I'm doing the right thing. Will you handle the rest? Second point is be strong. Be strong. This called for Joseph to step up to the plate and show some of his strength. So we were in, uh, we've been to Israel many times, and you pick things up and you hear things and you wonder where some of this is coming from. And so very often I've got my group of 50 or so that I'm, Sarah and I are dealing with and we have a guide who's telling us things that maybe aren't exactly jiving with the Bible. And so that's pretty common. In fact, I love the one guide we had. He was, um, he was from Nazareth. And uh, his shtick was, uh, see, there's two good things that have come from Nazareth. Okay, if you have to know your Bible to know that. Um, so when it says, and this is the passage, if you look at Matthew 13, take a look at it, because these are the only two passages that really talk about Joseph. It's the one that says he was just and unwilling to divorce her, so he's going to do that quietly. That's before he finds out what's going on, and then he stays. The other one is Matthew 13, and this is kind of a later-in-life story. And Matthew 13 reveals, a, this is the only passage that reveals it. Uh, Matthew 13, 55. Take a look at 53. And when Jesus finished these parables... This is Matthew 13, 53. He went away from there, and coming to his hometown, he taught them in the synagogue so that they were astonished. Where did this man get his wisdom in these mighty, mighty words? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? They're like, well, he shows up hometown, no honor in your own town. He's teaching. They're amazed at his teaching. <laughs> like, this guy's. But isn't that the carpenter's son? And that 
Mary, his mom, there's a demeaning tone happening right there. He's the carpenter. He's not educated. And her? This is 30 years later. But here's, take note, and this is that thing we heard in Israel that sent me into studying, not history of the church, but study the scriptures themselves. What did Joseph do for a living? And it's carpenter. I mean, we see it right here. The word is actually tecton. That's the word. He is a tecton. He's a craftsman. That's what he was. He's a craftsman. Wood. Um, metal. Stone. Stone. So in Israel, a lot of your guides, some a little bit more in your face, others trying to just help understand, they think he was a mason. Probably a stone mason. Well, that's because of location. There really wasn't much wood. Wood's from far away. Rock quarries? Yeah, right there. I mean, you can see it. I mean, you're, you're right there. You're just outside of Jerusalem. It's Bethlehem. Maybe a stonemason. That's Joseph. Which is it? You know, we actually don't know, but I think what we embrace on this, he's a craftsman. Maybe could do all three, right? Many of you are able to use your hands and actually apply some of the principles to several things. We're very specific today, so maybe not so much there. And then, he's a craftsman. Joseph, some type of a craftsman. He was just and he was unwilling to put her away in a shameful way. That's all we really know about him. He has other kids. We know that. If you read on, it says, and are not his brothers, James, Joseph, and Simon, and Judas? It's a different Judas, by the way. And are not all his sisters with us? When did this man get all of these things? Hmm. So, Catholicism. Catholicism has a, a little challenge where history of the church is set at a same level of authority as the Scriptures. So, if it's been declared, there's that matching with Scriptures, and so they'll blend those two more so. That's not a statement of criticism because of a, I have dear Catholic priest friends, and I say that, and he goes, yeah? Like, I'm not offended by that, where you and I are like, oh, I bet they hate you saying it. No, that's just the way it is. So, in Catholicism, in the history of Joseph, they do think that Jesus had siblings, and they were Joseph's. So, Joseph was pre-married. Something happened to his wife. He had kids. Then he's marrying Mary, who has Jesus, and she's never had relations with a man ever, before or after, and definitely doesn't have any other kids. That'd be history of the church. Likelihood, what's the Protestant take on it? When you drop the history of the church and the theology of the church, we tend to say, let's stay with the story. Let's not make this more miraculous than it really, really was, where Joseph's 18 to 20 years old. He's found this amazing gal. It's prearranged. And this prearranged marriage with this gal that's very typical age, neither one of them have kids. They get engaged to have kids, so then it's revealed that she's with child, and then there's the relational disaster going on. They settle through, and it's the history of the story, and then, of course, Jesus, and then 
they have other kids, and those are step-siblings, of course, to Jesus, because Joseph had nothing to do with them, but their mother is Mary. Does this all kind of make sense to you? So, you know, you decide. I mean, it's look at evidence of what that probably took place and what happened. That's probably it. But he's not ever again in a story. He's gone. Don't know. I don't know what happened. Obviously, during those years prior to Jesus' earthly ministry, which somewhere around age 30 to 33 or whatever that would be, somewhere previous, Joseph's gone, died, something happened. A lot of mention of Mary, no mention of Joseph. No one knows. Except in Catholicism, they know. <laughs> he lived to be an old guy, and it's St. Joseph. And yeah, I was sticking with the Bible. We're not sure what happened. I write a devotional on Wednesdays that I send out, and they're kind of based on Sunday's message, usually. And they, it is this coming week also. Uh, You're welcome to be added to that if you would like. But I found, and I love it, a picture, a painting, and you can find them. Google it for fun. A painting of Joseph holding baby Jesus. Right? It's always Mary and Jesus. It's always. There was one that showed Joseph with a halo, (laughs) the way they do with Mary. Right, Madonna with child. So it's that halo holding. And I loved seeing that. Other paintings where Joseph is working in the workshop with Jesus, showing him things. I love it. Very ordinary. He was apparently a pillar. Apparently, he was solid. We know he's just, he's willing to do the right thing, and he did. And apparently then he just kept his head down and he stayed the course. We too can stay strong. In staying strong, I wouldn't throw this out on the side. Back to the idea that he was protecting Mary. There's a general spirit amongst evangelical Christians that when somebody sins or something happens, we sure love to point it out. Well, it's because it's an easy way to take a moral high ground. Look what they did. You could clothe it different. Pray for them. They really need the Lord because look what they did. That wasn't, that wasn't Joseph. Joseph was a cover him, protector. When somebody sins, and let's drop the word sin, makes a big mistake, big mistake at work, big mistake at family. They did it intentionally, so it was clearly wrong. At school, it's a student at school that really messed things up. It may last for a while because there may be a police record. I mean, it's, they really messed up. The first thing that we do when we hear that is say, that so could be me. That could be me. Might have been you. That's me. If not for the grace of God, that is me. Am I right? It's not pointed out and separate them from us. It's, oh, that could be me. That was a huge mistake. But that could be me. And now let me go in and show love and acceptance and care and help them through this. And let's get as few gawking people as possible. That's very Joseph-esque. He was strong Also stay steady. We stay, he stayed steady, apparently. And I don't know. I don't know how. Oh, we so know so little about this guy. Mary's going to have this long line of people in heaven. 
Is this the Mary line? I want to meet her. Joseph's going to be over there sitting with his coffee. And we go, oh, wait a minute. I want to chat with him for a while. This guy's a pillar. This guy was strong. He was just. And he was very steady. There's a fun story. Uh, Sarah reads... um, uh, Sarah reads a lot, and so um, it wouldn't, it's not unusual for Sarah to read 100 books a year, so that's kind of a lot to me. I mean, I'm trying to get through the Bible. That's a big one, though. But that's actually 66 books, so let's really call it what it is. It's not one, so you get credit when you knock out those little ones. Um, so she does read a lot, and I usually don't read uh, anything that she reads. So that's like, it's kind of like a, a test. It's when she says, I've read that, I go, oh, that's great to know. That's obviously a book I'm not going to read. That's kind of how that works, because the interests are not the same. Uh, and there would be an exception to that, and that would, be, um, that would be this fun story of Michael and Roselle. And I think I have a picture of Michael and Roselle. Um, Michael and Roselle were these two characters uh, that were uh, become a little bit known because they were on they were on the 78th floor of the um, uh, World Trade Center North, and he tells the story that he's sitting at his desk and Roselle is sitting under the desk. Like usual, there was a boom, a loud, deep, unapologetic bellow that seemed to erupt to the very core of the earth. Eerily, the majestic high-rise slowly leaned to the south. No alarm sounded. No one had information about what was happening. It was 8.46 a.m. September 11th. Michael's unique because he was born blind, but he was born blind, and this wasn't like this dog that he's had for a long time. At the time, little Roselle, which I believe was called Thunder Dog, uh, was the little nickname because uh, the dog hated thunder. Little Roselle was only three years old, so he had her for nine months at that point, and that's all. He literally didn't know how this is going to play out because it was disastrous personally for individuals that were in the building. Michael said the office was empty except for himself, a co-worker, David, and Roselle under the desk. Not having any idea yet what was going on, he made a fast phone call, fortunately still working, of course, to his wife and said, I'm going to be home soon if I can. With that, Michael hung up and he grabbed the harness of Roselle and began issuing commands, hoping. They go out into the hallway and he said the chaos was quite outrageous. They made their way through flaming chunks of debris onto the stairwell, 78 floors with some security light, some not. He does mention the first responders going up while they were going down. They reach to the bottom floor, and it's one of those things that you don't really think of, but at World Trade Center, and as I would like, are the leather Bostonian shoe with leather soles. Well, that is not good when the floor is ankle deep of water, which is what it was in the World Trade Center. He said people were slipping and falling because their feet had no traction. Roselle was exhausted. So they're walking down through the lobby and Roselle, he could feel Roselle trying to go down to drink water, but the smell of jet fuel, he knew she can't, kept yanking her. He made it out and he said he could hear the things dropping and we know what was dropping as he rushed down, no idea at this point where he was going. Huge sound and He turns back and feels just the 
the debris, and that was, of course, it's an hour, I believe it's an hour and 45 minutes before that building had dropped, and it dropped. It's a great little heroic story where he was panicked and walking, and a shopkeeper threw a door open and screamed, get in here, get in here. And so we spent quite a bit of time in the back of that particular store. He said he had no idea what was going to happen. He had no idea what was going to happen with Roselle. She died, by the way, in 2011. He has a new dog now. But what he even points out was how ordinary he is and how ordinary this, this dog has no idea what's going on. The three of them literally had to navigate total unknown chaos. And he said, Roselle acted like it was just another day doing what's right. You get lost. You know how many of those stories probably that we'll never hear because that first tower dropped first. 800 people died. You think those stories of being just and willing and steady and strong are in those 800? Oh, I bet there are. You won't know them. Roselle, we know. We were at an airport with Nebraska, our boy seen eye dog, and we met someone who knows them. And so we're chatting. I'm like, is it really? It was, oh, no, Roselle's great. Little hero. Yeah, I don't want to be a hero. I don't want us to worry about being a hero. It's not about being a hero. I don't even know what hero is. Joseph had no idea. Joseph didn't experience the three years of his public ministry of Jesus. Think about this. He disappears sometime in the upbringing. Great kid. Oh, he's amazing. He had no idea. Well, wait, go back a decade, two decades. Wasn't he going to be the Messiah? Isn't he the king? Yeah, he is. I don't know what that means. I... No, put yourself in his shoes. He has no idea what's going on. He's not prompting him and saying, hey, maybe you need to go do something. You say, well, Mary did at the first miracle, right? That's the three years. We're talking about his life in the home and in the workshop as a craftsman. Joseph was just faithful. He literally, at that point, who knows? Did he doubt? I, I would assume he did. I'd drop Mary off the pedestal and say, I'm sure she went through that too. But it's not like he's a hero because, look, he was the, the earthly father, the stepfather to Jesus. He's a man. He had no clue. Yeah, I know he knew, but nothing was happening. And then he's gone. You don't know you being righteous and just in your family. You have no idea the repercussions of that. You may never know. Because you don't know what that grandchild or what that child is going to do and influence someone else now and what they're going to... We don't know all of that. So what's a hero? A hero is one who is just and righteous. And then we leave it to God to say, you know, I'm going to take a hit for this. I'm going to be the jerk on this team, or I'm going to end up being the jerk at school because I just, I'm not going to be demeaning, but I'm not doing that. And so you go home alone, or you miss another party that you would prefer being at, but because you value being just, you don't want to go. But you want to go. No, I'm going to be just and righteous. And you're sitting at home. And there's no parade. There's no, look, you're a hero. There's none of that. You're just home alone. But to God, you're a hero. And I don't know what he does with that, but what's that old phrase of Henry Blackaby? Anybody in the hands of God can do what God can do. That's what Joseph did. 
I'm going to put myself in the hand of God, and I'm going to be steady, and I'm going to be strong, and I'm going to be righteous and just, and then he's going to work out the rest. Doesn't that even just feel good? There's thousands of stories like that. And it's not marching out of a 78-story building, which is like walking down a mile and a half of stairs in chaos and smell and fumes. It may not be that. It's walking to school and going to your locker alone. It's going after work, realizing, I just got lied about, and I think I may have trouble with my job now. So what do I do? You do what's right, and you do what's just, and you stay steady, and you stay strong, and God will work out the details. No, probably not get called a hero. <laughs> no, that, that often doesn't happen. But to God, it does. And so when we look at this wonderful story of Joseph, we find out that being ordinary isn't that bad. We all of a sudden find out that just fulfilling what we're basically supposed to fulfill is all he's really asked for us. So why don't we pray together? We'll end right now in prayer. Let me ask you this in the quietness of the moment. Is there a decision you're facing that you know you need to do what's just? but it's going to take some work. You know, you've got to give something up. You're going to make a bad decision. Seemed right, but you know it's not the right decision. But you're willing to rethink this and say, I can be Joseph-esque. No one looking and you say, yeah, there's, I'm facing one and I need to do what's right. I'm going to commit to do what's right. No one's looking around. Just lift your hand up and say, yep, I'm going to do what's right in this situation. Is there one in your mind right now? That's right. Just lift it up and right back down. That's it. Yep, I do. I see you. Just right back down again. Yep, several cross. No one's going to throw a parade for you, but God will. Heavenly Father, we're asking right now that you would help us to be Joseph-esque that we would be right, just, and fair, steady, and strong, doing the right thing, and we trust you with the details. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.